that while the word is preached and while the spirit is moving, I could get healed like you. Anything can happen. Come on, Luke uh, 18. And uh, I want to look at verse 9, beginning with verse 9. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. When you have it, would you say amen? amen? Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Here's the story. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I currently, I'm currently not like the tax collector. I fast twice a week, and, I, and I'm a tither. <laughs> I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Now, here's Jesus' conclusion. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves <laughs> will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, I'm going to give you my subject this morning. It's going to sound a little corny, but work with me, okay? I'm going to make sense out of it. Today, I want to talk from the subject, leveling the praying field. I know we're used to hearing about how to level the playing field, but, but considering the context of what's happening God is going to, and this is what is happening in this season, I feel in my spirit. God is leveling the praying field. Let's pray. Lord, help. Amen. Amen. Let me tie my shoe. You may be seated. I told you, he just does everything. Look at this. This is, thank you, sir, because I'm too fat to get that low. And turn around and breathe. Thank you so much. Somebody say God is leveling the praying field. All right. Now, <clears throat> most of the time, when we talk about prayer, we have conversations regarding prayer, seminars regarding prayer. We have opportunities regarding prayer, trainings. They are all ways, or most of the time, centered around methodologies concerning prayer. Methodologies, ology means study of, so study of methods. When we talk about prayer, we often are teaching people different methods to prayer. I, I did this in a sense on Wednesday night, past Wednesday night, we were teaching about the discipline of prayer, and in essence, I taught about methods to prayer. And that's good. And I think that's important because the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. So the idea of having methods to prayer are important. However, I would suggest this morning that what may be greater than our methods in prayer are our motives in prayer. Yeah. Motives speak to the heart of the matter. And it's possible to have good methods, but if your motive for praying is not right, the prayer can still be hindered. Let me give you an example. Praying that God blows up your ex-husband's house <laughs> might not be the kind of prayer God wants to hear. I know somebody's like, shucks. <laughs> 
praying that somebody doesn't get a job opportunity because you are interested in that department may not be a prayer that God hears because heart posture matters in prayer. Can I get a witness? Consequently, this text for me becomes kind of like a tale of two prayers. You have a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, it's a parable, which means it's a story Jesus tells, but Jesus tells this story, and he makes it clear about the motive behind it. He tells this story in the first verse we read to those who had great confidence in their own righteousness, and thus they scorned other people. So Jesus illustrates it by telling a story about a Pharisee's prayer and a tax collector's prayer. Now, I gotta give you some background because I don't want you, I don't want to take for granted that you automatically know who these kinds of people are. Is that okay? Pharisees are interesting people. Pharisees originally were praised for being spiritual bridge builders. In the Old Testament, after the temple was destroyed and the people were exiled, then you started seeing because they scattered that they struggled to try to remain spiritual. I get it. And as a result, particularly by the time we get into the intertestamental period, that's the space between your Old Testament and New Testament. It's about 400 years worth of time. Pharisees became popular because they were law keepers. They were teachers and law keepers who were good at reminding people what the law of Moses said. All right? However, here's where it goes wrong. The more popular they got and the more people believed them, they started adding laws that people had to keep along with the laws of Moses. And by the time Jesus emerges on the scene, this uh, generation of Pharisees had become his chief opponents because they had such a, a grip, a religious grip on people's minds. They were considered legalistic. And as a result, they had so many rules that people had to keep that were made impossible and moreover were not even rules God asked for. I'm trying to keep this going, but I got to pause real quick to say it ain't nothing like church folk who make up rules Jesus didn't make. Have you ever met them and they'll condemn you over something they can't even prove in the scripture? Something somebody taught them, that somebody taught them, that somebody taught them, and they hold it to the same degree. We call it dogma. Something that you hold to the same degree as God's word, but it's not God's word at all. I'm not bound by your church constitution. I'm bound by the word of God. But sometimes people will lift up the church bylaws at the same level as the Bible. Pharisees. And I wondered, who made this monster? Right? Because they weren't always that way. But it teaches us a lesson. You got to be careful about being praised. Because praise will pump somebody up. Glory to God. I'm not talking about the praise we give. I'm talking about the praise we receive. The Bible says in Proverbs that the crucible is for silver. And the furnace is made for gold. And a man is tested by his praise. You may not understand it except you understand that silver is purified in a crucible and gold is purified in fire. And God says people are purified or tested to see what they are in praise. If you want to test a person's heart, compliment them. And see how they handle when they finally get attention. And that's what happens with the Pharisees. They started getting attention, and the more they got attention, they, they, they started straying away from the things of God. So in light of that, I want you to hear the Pharisee's prayer that Jesus tells us in this text. Here's the Pharisee. I could almost imagine the Pharisee had a hoop on him too. <laughs> oh, Lord. God, I thank you. It's in the text. I thank you that I'm not like other people cheaters and sinners and adulterers oh lord i thank you now catch this i told you it's a pharisee and a tax collector both in the temple so hear this next phrase i thank you that i'm certainly 
not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. Thank you, Jesus. And I give a tenth. I'm one of the top tithers. I bought a pew in the church. My family's name is in the stained glass window. Oh, Lord. Did you notice that in the Pharisee's prayer, he actually had no request? He didn't even ask God for anything. He, 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 he's not even seeking answers. He's only seeking affirmation that he's already right. Oh, you might want to buckle your seatbelt this morning, child. We're going to go on a roller coaster ride. He, he, he's only seeking God to find affirmation that he's already fixed. Now, what's interesting to me is the fact that he glossed over a few things. Y'all remember? He said uh, that, that I, I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. But if we're going to list the sins, why not go ahead and list all of them, Reverend? He didn't because his point is people always love to gloss over what they struggle with while they hammer others for what they struggle with. Preach, Doc. On the other side, so that's in the red trunks. In the blue trunks, we have a tax collector. Now, what you must understand about tax collectors. In, in, in today's culture, we don't really have tax collectors. We might have a tax consultant or people who help us file our taxes. But back then, they had tax collectors who would go around and collect taxes. Tax collectors, however, in Jewish culture were hated. And here's why. They were hated because... Uh, Israel or Judah, how you want to look at them, Judea, was a colony of Rome. So they had a little bit of freedom, but not that much. What Rome did, the empire did, is said, look, we'll let you worship how you want to worship. They even put money into their temple. We'll upgrade your temple for you. But, but, but understand, with all your worship, you still don't have any power in society. We don't mind you having your little synagogues and your temples, and your feasts, and your Passovers, and whatever else you want in your Jewish culture, but understand, you will not have sovereign control over your land. Doggone it, I want to stop again. I can't stop again. Because I would tell you, I think that's a satanic strategy. Let the church folks shout while the evil folk take over the world. So we fighting for positions on the board in church but everybody else is running for politics and handling business and taking over entertainment and taking over. And we end up, because we teach our children the best they can do is sing in the choir. Now, I don't need more youth choir members. I need somebody to go be a police officer and go be a lawyer and go be a teacher and go out here in the marketplace and go be a COO, a CEO. Y'all see what I'm trying to suggest here? As a consequence, then, they were up under Roman rule. And so tax collectors were those who would come around and collect taxes to send to Rome. And the Jewish folk ain't want to pay taxes. Whole other sermon. Because church folk don't like paying taxes. And as a result, though, what made the tax collector bad is most tax collectors would hike up their prices to take advantage of the people. So as a result, when you see the term tax collector used in the scripture, it's not just an occupation. It's often used to describe an opposition. It's to suggest that's one of them people. One of them cheaters. Now let's listen in light of that to his prayer. No who. He ain't got no music behind his. He stood at a distance, the Bible said, and dared not to even open up his eyes. Instead, he pounds his chest in sorrow, and here's his whole prayer. God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And both were in the temple. I dare you look at somebody and just ask them, which one are you? Oh, I dare you to ask it online. Which one are you? Which one are you? Don't worry. I'm not about to interview you to find out. But if we had to categorize somewhere, which one are you? And I, I raise this tension today 
because I was amazed that mother Jesus did not endorse the Pharisee. I'm shocked that Jesus didn't choose to side with the religious person. He didn't choose the seemingly righteous one. Can I teach us this morning? Three words you should write down. Righteousness. Unrighteousness. And self-righteousness. Righteousness. Unrighteousness. Self-righteousness. We often focus on the first two and overlook the third. And so we look at a person as either being righteous or being unrighteous. Now, the Bible teaches and makes it clear that righteousness is granted by God. Righteousness just in very simple terms means to be in the proper or right standing with God. It's to have right relationship with God. It's that simple. So to be made righteous, here's the catch, we are only made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says our righteousness is as of filthy rags, which means it's going to help somebody. I don't care how many things you quit or how many things you stop doing or how many ways you try to improve yourself. You can be as seemingly clean as a nun and it doesn't make you righteous. It just makes you clean. It may make you moral, but righteousness is only imputed to us by faith in Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Unrighteousness then would be to be uh, to to not be clean or to be in wrong standing with God, to have no relationship with Jesus Christ. But there's a thin slice of meat in the middle between righteousness and unrighteousness that we often overlook. And it's something called self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is the belief that one has right standing with God based upon their own self. So I become judge, jury, and executioner of my own standing with God and thus it tends to make me think I have the capacity to act like God in somebody else's life. Talk Rousey. Self-righteousness is an attitude or a spirit that will let someone exist in the presence of God for the goal to merely look better or sing better than somebody else. You ever had a relative who was self-righteous and every decision you make, they always preach at you about child, you need to get yourself together. Because you know we don't tolerate that around here. And you know, now the way I know God and the way, and by the time they give you all the I, 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 it has turned you completely off. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? It's a spirit of self-righteousness. And I came today because I am convinced, church, that it's not the sinners who give Jesus problems. It's the super saints who like to demean others in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to say that one more again because it felt good down in my shondo. I said that it's not the sinners who give you. Read the Gospels. It wasn't the sinners. It wasn't the blind man, the lame man, the woman caught in adultery, the this, the that, the other that Jesus had to fight with. It was the pseudo saints. It was the Pharisees. It was the Sadducees. It was the Ascens. It was the Sanhedrin. It was the Jewish council. It's always the messy church folk. That get in Jesus' way of being able to change somebody's life. And I'm convinced that that isn't stuck in Bible days. But that is true in the day we live in now. That it's possible that we got Pharisees that sneak into our churches and occupy important seats. And they stand in places of judgment. And they always got something to say about what somebody else is trying to do in their walk with Christ. 
and as a result it's hard for us to even hear the tax collector's prayer because the Pharisee is so busy trying to testify for everybody so we can see how holy they are and how righteous they think they are and how uppity they feel they are and how much they think they know God And I know it's not a shouting sermon today. I'm not even in the mood to shout. I'm perfectly fine if I don't shout. I want to argue today that ultimately what Jesus argues is that self-righteousness is sin too. So, I, Oh, Lord, that dress is just too short, child. I can see things I'm not supposed to see. Girl, you smell that weed on our row in church today. Somebody didn't had a common decency to spray before they came in church. I went to go speak. He had alcohol right on his breath. Child, was that man with a man? You know, here goes the line. Now, look, you got to keep this between just me and you because I ain't really supposed to tell nobody. But, but I got some tea if you thirsty. Oh, I'm coming after you today. Because what I really wish the Lord would let the rest of us do is say, child, you seen that self-righteous spirit on her today? Up there prancing around like they laying hands on the sick. And like they the only ones with the oil. I got some tea if you want it. You, you see them people in there who act like they can't praise the Lord. Because worship is, is, you know, they got a position. So worship is not really what they praise ain't what they do. What am I trying to suggest? I wish I had time with y'all. I wish I had time. I ain't got time with y'all. I wish I had time. Because I would remind you that the Bible talks not just about sins of the flesh, but sins of the spirit. And we love talking about sins of the flesh, which are sins we can see. But what about sins of the spirit like pride? <laughs> which is so great that God says in Proverbs, I hate a proud look. He says, I hate to even look. I hate when you act uppity. You come in a room with your head in the air like you got yourself where you are. Pulled yourself up by your bootstraps like we don't remember where I brought you from. I hate when you come in my presence and you act, God says, like you got yourself here and like you've always got it together when I know you. I see you in the shower. I see you at home. I see you at night. I see you when you're lighting up. I see you when you're about to give up. I see you. I know you. I know I God, I don't have time. I don't have time. I better get back on track. I said this to my wife the other day. I said, baby, isn't it interesting that everything that comes out of the body, just about everything that comes out of the body stinks? Whether it's vomit, whether it's feces, whether it's urine, anything that comes out of the body, mucus, it always stinks. And I thought about that scripture where Jesus said, it's not what goes in a man that defiles him, it's what comes out. And I said, I wish we would pay more attention to the fact that without God, everything about us stinks. If we ever, if we ever got to a place that we recognize that without God, we are nothing, it would level the praying feel oh y'all got my message today it would shut it all down you wouldn't have folks while we say everybody come on let's worship God we don't need spectators in the room like security guards for the move of God and we don't call like we got an earpiece in because we want to be the spiritual CIA and intelligence no how about if you praise God with me then the glory of God can fall I don't need security guards for my holy life I need somebody who can intercede when I'm in a season of weakness I don't need somebody to judge me the Bible said there is one lawgiver and his name is Jesus the righteous who made
made you judge. He says in James that if you are a, a judge of the word, you cannot be a doer of the word. You can either be a hearer, a doer, or a judge. But if you're going to be a judge, you're not a doer. And I came today to stand on two flat feet to come against the spirit of self-righteousness in the church of Jesus Christ. It's keeping our young people from being saved. It's keeping a generation from seeking God. It's keeping a people from knowing who God is. It's not because they don't want a hunger or have a hunger for Jesus. It's that every time they try to find Jesus, they run into a Pharisee. I was looking for Christ and I ran into the Sanhedrin. I was looking for Jesus and I ran into one of his people. And as a result, I was so turned off because how can you clean a fish before you catch it? I know I'm not going to get any amens and I don't care. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm sick of the spirit of self-righteousness in the body of Christ that when it's my need and my situation and my breakthrough, I want everybody to be on one accord. But when it's your time to be blessed, I act like I'm too busy to bless you or like it's not my issue at all or like I don't care. And that, Jesus says, is what's hindering the next move of God. Your righteousness, let me say there so you don't get offended. Their righteousness ain't really righteousness if it makes them hate everybody who's not like them. Come here, America. Because I get it, right? Because the blood of Jesus is on the ballot, right? If your righteousness makes it so clear to you, and I'm not advocating for any candidate, I, I don't care. But if your righteousness is so righteous to you that you just can't imagine the evil of supporting a woman's right to choose. Because you pro-life. I just got one question for you. Are you also pro-life if the court sees evidence that a man on death row didn't do it. And people are petitioning the Supreme Court to withhold his execution. Do you still care about the life then? Or do you only care about the life when it's in the womb? I'm just curious. Did you also care about the life when the very politicians had side babies? And situations they needed to take care of. I'm, I'm just curious. Because it's on the ballot, right? And I just, I just can't support evil. I can't support the idea of same-sex marriage or people who want to be claiming they want to choose who they love. But what about the joker in the closet? I know this is the only stuff I can't preach this nowhere else but here because y'all the only ones who let me talk about it. We would rather somebody lie about what they are and how they feel than for them to be able to be expressively themselves and still see God. So now they're going to hell because of that, but you're not going to hell for unforgiveness you've had for 50 years against somebody who's now dead? In guns we trust. Y'all sit down. I'm, I'm going to get off of that. I'm, I'm just telling you that if we had to canvas sin, self-righteousness would be at the top of the list. So Jesus, I'm almost done. Thank you. So Jesus does the unthinkable with this scripture. He levels the praying field. How does he do it? He says, I'm going to bring the low up 
and I'm going to bring the high. So this is what he said in the text. He said, whoever exalts himself will be humble. Hallelujah. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. I'm going to even it out. And we're going to see how strong somebody's prayer life really is when you don't get to hide behind your religion. I'm sorry, that was my shout. Y'all missed it. He, he said, I'm going to see anybody can war cry in the church. Let me put you on the cancer ward. Any, anybody can talk about somebody when it's comfortable but let it be your child in trouble I'm going to level the praying field Jesus is dismantling a spirit of self righteousness and he is attending to the prayers of people who know they need God. And we church are living in times now that are so bad that religion without the right heart won't work anymore. Don't come up to me spitting in my face and tongues if you can't speak to me in English. I don't need a prophecy. I need an apology. <laughs> Y'all not going to talk to me. I need some love for love covers a multitude of sin. I, I don't need you telling me about my future. I need you to help reconcile my past. Now, I've said enough about and to the Pharisee. I'm done with you. I want to preach to the tax collectors. I want to preach to the people who are less than perfect. I want to preach to the people who often judge yourself, sometimes condemn yourself. I want to talk to people who feel you're not good enough for God. I want to talk to the people who think twice before you pray. You shudder and stutter at the idea of going before the Lord because you think you're not worthy enough for your request to be answered. I want to talk to somebody this morning. You might be watching me online. It may be Tuesday afternoon, but you're watching me. Whatever time it is and in whatever place you are, I want to talk to the unperfect people. I want to talk to the people who feel like you're not worthy enough for what you're asking God for. I want to talk to the people who can recognize they need God. I want to talk to the people who are humble enough to admit I'm nothing without him. And I know that in me dwells no good thing. And if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. I want to talk to that person, the one the one the one who, who's thankful that people are running with the lie because you know if they ever had their hands on the truth and that's the only reason why you're not going off on Facebook because you're really low-key thankful that at least what they're saying about you ain't true because there are a couple of things from a previous chapters in your life that if they knew that it could ruin your credibility and so you just end up reconciling God instead of me getting upset and going off I'm going to just thank you they can run with it they can have it I got folk lying on me right now go ahead go ahead, tell whatever you want to tell I'm just grateful because God knows the stuff I have done and God knows the places I have been and God knows the places where I'm not perfect and God knows the places where I'm a wretch undone and God knows the places where I'm trifling and duplicitous and places where I'm unfair and places where I'm unjust and places where I get mad Lord I'm thank you I thank you that people say whatever they want to say about me because I know had, had the truth ever been told don't worry I ain't talking about you I'm talking about me I'm talking about me I'm talking about me I done had one or two Sundays in my 20 years of preaching where I didn't took holy communion twice I had the holy kind in the a.m. had the unholy kind in the p.m. because I had to deal with Negroes 
I had to deal with some Negroes. They ain't here no more, but I had to deal with some Negroes that kind of get a brother off his kilter. What am I telling you? That you can't embarrass somebody who's already honest about their frailty. There ain't nothing you can say about somebody who's already honest about the fact that without God, I'm nothing. And the, had the Lord not kept me and helped me and blessed me and let me and fed me. I'm so sick of hypocrites talking about other hypocrites talking about other people the devil is a lie let's pull your rap sheet and let's all come to the foot of the altar together where are my tax collectors in here who oh god who know what it's like to be mad about something but you really can't be mad because god really snatched you out of it how you mad at her for taking your man you were sharing with her you just mad she won. You ought to thank God, though, that God didn't leave you stuck with that trifling, no good dog. Can I buy a witness in here? Is there anybody who has learned to be grateful? God, I'm thank you that I didn't get that job. Thank you that I didn't move to that city. Thank you that you didn't let that happen to me. Thank you that things didn't go my way. Because had I had it my way, I would have settled for something that was less than what God had for me. Thank you for keeping me in stupid seasons when I didn't even know my left from my right and my right from my wrong. I want somebody who can testify and you don't mind telling a little bit of your business. Summarize it this way. Look at a few folks and just say he leveled it. 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 He made my enemies behave. He leveled it. He shut me and my haters down. He, he leveled it. He, he quieted me and the folks that didn't like me. And the reason I can shout so loud is because if God had not leveled it, I wouldn't be here today. I wonder, can we shut Bainbridge down for 30 seconds I want every tax collector who's just glad that God had mercy on your life give him any kind of praise you got because I was innocent. I'm shouting because in spite of being guilty, he had mercy on me. He had mercy. I'm shouting because the Lord is so full of mercy that morning by morning, I think I'm gonna quit preaching. No, I, 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 I ain't even gotta finish. I'm gonna close right here while it's good. But I got a word for the unperfect people. And I'm gonna end my sermon right here. I'm not even gonna finish it, Pop. I'm gonna end my sermon, but I'm gonna drop this bombshell for the imperfect people. And here's God's word to somebody who's been imperfect but you've been honest and faithful. Y'all put the point on the screen. Here's what God says to you. God says, sometimes your heart may just be what gets your prayer answered. I'm not even going to exhaust it. Minister Hope, because I, 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 I'm learning now Dr. Angie, that, that if I hit a vein, just stop. You did your job. So I'm, I'm done. Y'all can stand. But I'm going to leave this right here. Because I, what, I what this tax collector shows us is that it's not your perfection, nor is it your eloquence, nor is it your skill. 
nor is it your ability. It's not your associations. It's not your accoutrements. What gets you heard by God is the very thing that got the other man unheard by God. It's your heart. So you let them work on their skill. You work on your heart. I'm not saying don't work on your skill. I'm saying about what you let them prioritize the aesthetics, the, 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 the glam and the glitter and the gold. Elder Bobby, this is a word for you. You let, let them work on the clothes and the, and the clothes and the look and the holler and the hoop. You make sure when you open your mouth to preach, they hear the heart. When you sing, let somebody, let, let everybody else have the runs and the riffs. And the they can have it. Because I've seen God take a washboard, a bass drum, and a good heart. And send the glory in a place. You, you let them politic for the promotion on the job. You make sure your heart is right. Because your heart may be the thing that gets your prayers answered. And so I want to congratulate somebody, hallelujah, who uh, hadn't had a perfect path, a perfect past, but you got a good heart. God told me to tell you, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. I promise y'all, I preach better this week. I, God sees your heart. God, God knows you tried. God knows you did the best you could. And sometimes the best you can do is to beat your chest and be vulnerable with God. And he says, that's what I look for. I'm going to say two more things I'm going to pray. Number one, have you noticed that the guy who gets credit for his heart was a jacked up man in scripture. David was called a man after God's heart. But he lied. He was a murderer, an adulterer. The kind of stuff, here it is, you wouldn't let your preacher be. But definitely not your king. I want to get into that. Because people think I make an excuse for sin. I don't make an excuse for sin on, on any level. But we praise biblical characters who would never pass in modern, in our modern context of ministry. Like Moses. You going to follow a murderer? You sure? A murderer who didn't go to jail? You see the point? But yet we call David a man after God's own heart. It wasn't because he had a good record. It's because he had a good tendency to repent before God. And he didn't always do it easily. Nathan had to come check him. But when the light bulb went off, he always got it right. And it shows us God honors heart. Here's my last example. And this was, this was going to be my little clothes, but it, you know. Y'all do know Jesus didn't die alone, right? When Jesus died on the cross, he died on one cross sandwiched between two others. Hallelujah. He died between two malefactors, two criminals. We call them two thieves. If you study the seven last words of Christ, you know that one thief was offered paradise that day and one thief was not. What was the difference between the two thieves? Was it their crimes? 
was one less guilty than the other, the only difference between their outcomes, hallelujah, is that one of them, while hanging on a cross, was smart enough to say, while the other one was saying, you saved everybody else, you can't save yourself. If you really be who you say you are, save yourself and save us. Oh my God, I got to stop preaching. It just dawned on me after all these years that the other thief did ask Jesus to save him. He literally said, save us. And he was not saved. Because confession alone isn't enough. You can't just confess with your mouth. You got to believe in your So the other thief said, ironically, the other thief didn't say, save me. He said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, just remember me. I don't even know what he meant. Jesus knew what he meant. And he says to a grief, sin stricken guilty man today you will be with me in paradise my brothers and sisters I want you to spend this week asking God give me a clean heart now I'm going to pray. I'm not going to ask you to hold hands because, you know, flu season, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, just germs everywhere. Kids at school bringing germs home. So you ain't got to worry about that. But, but consider this. I don't know if y'all ever saw this. But, like, you got a mama or big mama who's, who's, like, is fussing at all the kids over something that really, like, one kid did. But you know how everybody gets to. Or the teacher who does it in class. Isn't it funny? That the people who have right hearts are always the ones who feel guilty and apologetic. They didn't even do it, but they're coming back saying, I'm so sorry. I'm going to do better. And the one who needed to hear it sitting there like. I feel the same thing happens with our time with God. And I want to say this because for somebody who's felt guilty lately or even if you hear this kind of word and you're like, oh my God, Lord. Wow, God, I'm sorry. I want to tell you, conviction is a sign your heart is right. If your heart wasn't right, you wouldn't feel anything at all. If your heart wasn't right, you wouldn't care. That's what it means to be reprobate. There's no probate for you. We can't help you because you're gone. If you can hear the words I'm saying right now and something I said pricked you in the heart, that means your heart is good. Now what I want to do is make sure your heart is right with God. He's leveling the praying field so that those of us who feel like we're just some little old person in the back and I'm not one of those big people. Guess what? He leveled it for you so that you can cast your cares upon the Lord and God will hear your prayers just as much as he'll hear mine. Don't get me wrong. I get it. I want my pastor to pray for me too. I enjoy having an intercessor or a prophet or somebody else encourage me in the Lord. But just in case I can't find anybody else, I want the record to reflect God hears my prayer too. So God, right now, I pray for every imperfect person, imperfect person. I pray for every person under the sound of my voice who has ever wrestled because they feel perhaps that they're not good enough for the connection with you that they desire. God, this isn't about spiritual gifts. This isn't about abilities. This is a matter of heart. And I pray today in the name of Jesus the Christ 
just as you sent your presence in this room, I believe you did it so that you could work on our hearts, so that you could show us who we are in you. God, I, I also pray for someone who may struggle with the heart of the Pharisee. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person, but God, I admit perhaps I tend to be a bit judgmental and I'm always critical of everybody else and I always got something to say when it's somebody else's situation. So God, I ask you to give me a clean heart. Lord, I wish that Pharisee knew that the same grace extended to the tax collector could have been extended to him had he asked for it. So God, I, I pray that today I don't waste my time in your presence reminding you of how good I am and 